My name's Kathy Devine and I worked at the University of Cumbria for 23 years as a senior lecturer in sport and physical activity. Prior to that, I worked at the National Federation of Women's Institutes as head of sport, the National Coaching Foundation, responsible for women and coaching. I'm a windsurfing instructor, a gymnastics coach and a trampoline coach. <laughs> and they're about sport. So, get my presentation moving. So according to the rule book, the Labour Party is a democratic party, working for open democracy where decisions are taken by the communities they affect. So, are decisions about women's sport taken by women? <laughs> Do women consent? The answers are no. I've worked in sport development for girls and women for over 40 years. I was on the organising committee for the first International Women in Sport Conference in 1994, here in Brighton at the Grand, with delegates from 82 countries, organised by the Sports Council and supported by the IOC. My research using feminist political philosophy on the London Olympics in 2012, sex, sport and justice, when the word sex was allowed, in 2016, and sex, sport and money in 2018, detail the sexual politics of sport. <coughs> sport is an enduring bastion of androcentric citizenship, male privilege and power, despite neo-managerial equality rhetoric. Schools disproportionately provide, provide sport the boys want, mainly competitive team games, mainly football, outsourced to coaches funded by the football industry, creating the consumers of the future. Meanwhile, girls report over and over and over again, they don't care, they are not listening to what people actually want to do. Sports councils disproportionately fund the sports men want, mainly football. Academia is awash with technocratic rather than democratic debate about male elite competitive sports, cheating, doping, values and rules. Female voices are occasionally sought but widely ignored. My recent re research published in June 2021 with 19 female Olympians does something very, very simple. It lets them speak. Something essential for democratic sport policy. I asked them, do they consent to the IOC guidelines for transgender inclusion in their own female categories? They do not. They agree both female and transgender athletes should be fairly included in sport. They do not agree the science shows no competitive advantage for trans women in female categories. They are right, as Emma has just outlined. They think the IOC should revisit the rules, and so now does the IOC. However, they think they cannot discuss this without being called transphobic. Again, they are right. Female athletes are routinely labelled anti-inclusive, transphobic, bigoted or intolerant for questioning the scientific evidence and fairness of existing guidelines. This is what we would call a patriarchal discourse, framing women's socio-political interventions as emotional, irrational fears and phobias, rather than rational, logical and evidence-based. It negates the personhood, scientific understanding, embodied lived experience and equal socio-political value of female elite athletes within policy deliberations about their own categories. It is insupportable. They are effectively silenced. It is anti-democratic, the very definition of sexist. No wonder they think our human rights, in the, in the words of two of them, our human rights to equal opportunities are not being protected. And they ask, why don't women matter? My paper on sports participation, gender self-identification and the Equality Act has just been accepted for publication. Hooray! Subject to minor amendments. <laughs> I have to say though, after 18 months, reviewers said talking about biological sex in male and female bodied people is transphobic, sex as well as gender is socially constructed, saying opposite biological sex is apparently, get this, sexist, homophobic and transphobic and biologically incorrect. <laughs> Trans women's bodies are female bodies if they say so. 
This is from a rev uh, an academic reviewer of an academic paper. I've got two biology degrees. I've got two biology degrees. <laughs> I've got my ideas. <laughs> Okay, female sport categories are legal for fairness and safety reasons in gender, meaning sex, affected sports. From puberty, most sports involve competitive activity where the physical strength, stamina or physique of average females puts them at a disadvantage, as Emma has outlined. So even with a gender recognition certificate, trans women can legally or even must legally be excluded from female categories. But the law is widely misunderstood or ignored. Sports often use gender identity rather than sex eligibility criteria, even in sex-affected sports. So how will this affect female categories? Most sports are male-dominated and people don't know this. For example, and you probably can't see that slide, but for example, 90% of football participants are male, only 10% are female. Stonewall estimates 1% of the population self-identify as trans, which is 100 times more than the numbers of trans people who have a GRC. So self-ID increases the number of trans people um, by a factor of 100. The vast majority of those trans people have made no medical transition whatsoever. So in terms of biology, the issues about male biology and female categories is the same. And two thirds of transgender people are biologically male. So we need to look at this, it's called equality evidence. The sports councils, the governing bodies of sport, all need to look at this before deciding that self-identity um, eligibility criteria should hold for sports participation. Because overriding biological sex with self-identification of gender means 10% of footballers and cricketers in female categories could be biological males, whereas less than 0.1% in male categories would be biological females. That's a factor of 100, 100 times fewer, okay? And that's because of a small number of a big pool of people moving into a small pool of people makes a disproportionately large um, difference. This compromises equal opportunities for females and may not even be legal in sex-affected sports. Democracy is not served by primarily males, that is males, but men and trans women regulating female bodies or deciding eligibility for female categories. It is absurd. It's not, democracy is not served for abortion or for sport. Girls and women must decide which sports they want to do and these should be equally valued and funded. Women must decide eligibility criteria for female categories, their own categories. Sport policy, the Equality Act, and Labour Party policy must work for women. Hard for some to grasp, I know, but women are people. Consent, not coercion, is central to egalitarian sport policy, democracy, and the human rights of girls and women. Thank you.